Welcome everybody um, to the October edition of Eversight's webinar series. Uh, today we have DeSaic surgery in the glaucoma patient with Dr. Daniel Montenegro. Um, all participants will be uh, muted throughout the duration of the webinar, but please do ask questions for Dr. Montenegro. You can do that by entering them into the Q&A panel um, on your screen and they will be answered at the end of the webinar. Um, also, please don't forget to register for next month's talk, uh, Manual Techniques for Dalk and Keratoconus with Dr. Uri Soiberman from Johns Hopkins. And as always, this webinar and all of our webinars will be uh, recorded and available on demand on our website um, at eversightvision.org slash webinars. And so now I'd like to just briefly introduce Dr. Montenegro. Um, Dr. Montenegro is from Venezuela and is fluent in both English and Spanish. Um, he did his ophthalmology residency at the Kresge Eye Institute in Detroit, followed by a uh, cornea and refractive uh, fellowship at the Dean McGee Eye Institute in Oklahoma City. Um, Dr. Montenegro then returned to join faculty and practice at Kresge, uh, as well as the John Dingle uh, VA Hospital in Detroit, where he spent several years, and has now moved back to Florida with his family, where he currently practices. Uh, at the Eye Centers of South Florida in North Miami Beach, Florida. And with no further ado, I'll let you um, take it away, Dr. Montenegro. All righty, thank you, Michael, and good night, everyone. I'd like to thank Michael for organizing this webinar and for always being so supportive um, with our eye banking needs and helping our patients uh, achieve very good outcomes. Um, so let's get started. So. There's a little bit of a delay here uh, changing the slide. Okay, now, now we're good. So I have no financial interest or disclosures related to this topic. And um, as you all, uh, I'm sure you've come across your uh, patients with glaucoma, um, who are on several glaucoma medications, or they've also had glaucoma surgeries like trabeculectomies or um, glaucoma drainage devices. Um, these patients will usually have corneas that, are, that don't look like your normal cornea that's clear. Um, we know that traps and glaucoma drainage devices do increase the rate of endothel endothelial cell loss um, in naive corneas without transplants. However, in patients that have received transplants, the rate of endothelial cell loss is higher and can result in earlier graft failure, which poses a challenge for us cornea surgeons managing these patients with glaucoma. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the mechanisms of endothelial, endothelial cell loss um, in the patient that's had a, either a TRAB or a glaucoma drainage device, such as a Omidvol, with a tube that may be, um, you know, uh, close to the corneal endothelium in the anterior chamber. Um, the first mechanism is the most obvious one, which is mechanical, that is direct trauma of the corneal tube to the corneal endothelium. But interestingly, there have been many reported cases in which the, uh, the tube from the glaucoma drainage device is really away from the corneal endothelium and not in direct contact. And yet these cornea transplants, PKs or DSECs, still wind up failing over time. So why is this occurring? And, and the answer to that question um, can be answered by some research that's been done. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a little in a second. So this is indirect trauma to endothelial cells. And the thought is, is that there's a disturbance uh, or an alteration in the blood aqueous fluid barrier, and there's retrograde flow of inflammatory mediators and other uh, proteins that can generate apopto apoptosis in endothelial cells by migrating to the anterior chamber. And another very important factor is the intraocular pressure. So if the IOP is higher in a patient that's had a, a transplant, most likely that graft will fail sooner if the IOP tends to be high and uncontrolled. So this is a study that looked at um, corneas without transplants. These are um, naive corneas that underwent um, either phacoemulsification alone or phacoemulsification 
with a trabeculectomy, which is group two. Group one is just a trabeculectomy group. And group three is a group that had a staged phaco emulsification and a trabeculectomy. So this was a prospective study done in Spain. And what this study found was that in corneas that had uh, a trabeculectomy alone, there was no significant change in the number of endothelial cells compared to the control group. In the second group, which had a combined phaco emulsification and trabeculectomy, they found that there was a significant de decrease in endothelial cell, num endothelial cell number. But what was more significant than all other groups was the staged phaco emulsification and trabeculectomy group, which for me was a little bit surprising. I, I was not expecting this result, but this is what the study showed that in patients that had a staged phaco emulsification followed by a trabeculectomy, they had a, a greater decrease in their endothelial cell number that was statistically significant compared to the control group. And you can see in the bottom right, the abnormal uh, endothelial cells after each procedure. So um, now we have other glaucoma procedures that didn't exist you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. These are uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery devices. Um, the first one that was probably introduced into market was the eye stent. And now there have been several different iterations of MIGS devices. And the FDA is looking very closely at how MIGS devices alter endothelial cells um, after they are implanted. So um, it is very important to note that there have been MIGS devices that have been voluntarily withdrawn from the market due to uh, a significant increase in endothelial cell loss after five years, which is usually around 30% of endothelial cell loss after five years. That's what the FDA considers uh, significant. And the SciPass microstent, which was introduced in 2000, around 2018, had to be withdrawn because it showed um, endothelial cell loss that was considered significant by the uh, Food and Drug Administration. This is the only MIGS device, to my knowledge, that has had to be withdrawn um, because of uh, a greater number of endothelial cell loss than is uh, uh, required by the FDA. So when we have a patient with glaucoma and corneal decompensation, they have corneal edema, uh, and they've had a previous glaucoma surgery, we're faced with a decision of what surgery would benefit this patient the most. Um, what, what the challenge that we face is that the view to the anterior chamber can be very poor with corneal decompensation after they've had a glaucoma surgery. Also add to the fact, add to the matter that these patients are already on glaucoma medications with which don't help the ocular surface and cause more epithelial irregularities, making a surgery like a DSEC or a DMEC more challenging because our view is not great. But I'm gonna go by some, I'm gonna discuss some techniques that might help you in these surgeries so that you can get through a DSEC procedure um, successfully, even if your view to the anterior chamber is not great. And um, on the left here, you see your conventional uh, PKP surgery, which, uh, you know, many years ago was the uh, standard of care for corneal edema, but now we're moving to DSEC and DMEC in these patients, which offers many benefits. So how did you get to endothelial keratoplasty, DSEC and DMEC surgery? Um, the movement began around 1999 when Garrett Mells introduced posterior lamellar keratoplasty and then Mark Terry um, later introduced deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty. And Matt Gorovoy has been, you know, uh, the godfather when it comes to DSEC and uh, really perfecting this technique. Uh, and in uh, 2006, around the same time, Garrett Mels introduced DMEC. So the indications for these procedures are fugue dystrophy, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, eye syndrome, and congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, otherwise known as CHED. So why choose DSEC over a PK in your glaucoma patient that has corneal decompensation? 
Well, there are several reasons that you all probably know very well. Uh, when you do a PK surgery, you're open sky for part of the procedure, and there is a risk of uh, intraoperative uh, expulsive choroidal hemorrhage, which can be devastating for the patient and also causes a lot of stress to the surgeon. PKPs carry an increased risk of endothelial, endothelial rejection. There is longer recovery time. You can have a suture complication, such as a, a localized rejection, uh, a broken suture, or uh, an infection related to a broken suture with an infiltrate. Uh, you can also have atypical microbial and also viral infections in the setting of a PKP. And we've all seen the unfortunate case of a patient that had a good outcome after a PKP, but after minor trauma, such as playing a basketball game, has a suture dehiscence and might need an emergency PKP surgery and never recover that vision that he once had, which can be very devastating for the patient. So with glaucoma drainage devices, um, like we discussed, if there is no direct trauma to the endothelium, keep in mind that even though the omid valve is perfectly positioned, it can be in the anterior chamber or it can be in the pars plana, the aqueous humor proteins or the proteome undergoes some changes because there's retrograde flow of apoptotic proteins and inflammatory mediators to the anterior chamber. These proteins decrease the lifespan of the endothelial cells. So keep that in mind. And amide valves do have, um, the valve itself is designed to prevent retrograde flow of fluid into the anterior chamber. But we still see, um, based on proteomic analysis, studies that have drawn aqueous fluid in the setting of an amide valve, and they've run a proteomic analysis, and they've shown compared to controls that these eyes with amid valves have an altered proteome based on analysis of the aqueous humor after these procedures. So this is the data that supports this theory of indirect endothelial cell loss damage. The COGA study was very important looking at the outcomes of penetrating keratoplasty grafts uh, in the setting of glaucoma drainage devices. What the COGA study showed um, was that after six months, 93% of PK grafts uh, were clear. After one year, 87% of grafts remained clear. After two years, the number, the percentage of grafts that remained clear were 59%. After five years, none of the PK grafts were clear when they had a glaucoma drainage implant. That is very impressive. And these uh, glaucoma drainage devices or in the pars plana. So the conclusion of the study was that PK with semi-simultaneous glaucoma drainage device in the pars plana has comparable or lower rates of, lower rates of corneal graft failure and immuno immunolo immunologic rejection compared to your traditional limbal-based glaucoma drainage device. This is a case report of a patient that uh, I took care of. This was a 65-year-old female who had persistent corneal edema. Uh, she had a TRAV surgery and she was very, very symptomatic. Her vision was about 2,400 in the left eye. She really was, um, I, it's hard to describe. Her, her pain was just persistent every day and her cornea was very edematous. She had a trabeculectomy in the left eye. She was also on bromonidine and COSOP ocular hypotensives. Her pressure was uh, somewhat controlled as about 20 in the left eye, and she has significant co uh, corneal stromal and epithelial edema uh, with a functioning, functioning uh, filtering bleb. There was no view to the posterior pole uh, because of the corneal edema, and she was uh, already pseudophagic with a PCIOL. So I'm just gonna go through the steps of this surgery and my approach to get through a challenging case with a limited view of the uh, anterior chamber. So this is the uh, intraoperative view uh, from the microscope. Uh, the patient had, as you can see, 
You can barely see the pupil in this eye. There's diffuse edema, and you can see on the top left the, 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 the bleb that uh, has a whitish color to it. Um, this, this was a case that I was considering a PKP because my view was obviously very poor, but I know that a PKP is a more invasive surgery, and even though it can be technically easier, postoperatively, I know that I'm going to be faced, and the patient will also have to face more challenges. So I would rather uh, do my best to perform a DSEC and uh, provide the advantage of faster visual recovery and also less risk with the surgery. So let's get to it. Let's, let's see the, the steps in the surgery. Well, what I'd like to do first in these cases where there's very limited view of the anterior chamber is to uh, do a superficial keratectomy. So here I'm using my beaver blade <clears throat> to just remove uh, about 80% of the epithelium. And then once I do that, once I do my superficial keratectomy, at least now you can see in this view that I can see the pupil. The pupil is round and I can see the I can see the, the, the reflection of the uh, PCIOL that's well positioned. Um, this patient's dilation status, uh, I was not sure about. I don't know how well this pupil would, will dilate given that it has chronic glaucoma and other comorbidities. So instead of doing the cycloplegia at the end of the surgery with home atropine, um, I elected to do an inferior PI. Um, so by doing an inferior PI at the beginning of the case, I don't have to worry about pupillary block and, um, you know, uh, not being able to dilate the pupil once I finish the case. So we did an inferior uh, PI with the vitrector, as you can see here with my fat bimanual vitrectomy instruments. Once we had that PI done, we then do an 8 uh, 8 -0, uh, mark on the cornea with a ring marker. I marked the periphery where I'm gonna score and strip decimase membrane and also the center of the cornea so that we can see that our graft is centered at the end of the case. This is the scoring and stripping of decimase membrane in this, in this patient with pseudophagic bulls keratopathy. We use a reverse Sinsky hook. Once we've uh, scored decimase membrane and separated it, uh, we then use uh, our for our utrata forceps to remove the decimate membrane. And you can see that there uh, as a utrata forceps is pulling, uh, removing that decimate membrane. Very important step is to roughen the stroma. Uh, by roughening the stroma, uh, we promote adhesion of the DSEC graft to the patient's uh, own stroma. And this is very important. You have to make sure to really roughen that stroma outside of, the, outside of the center in the periphery, because you know that in these patients with a trab or a tube, the airfill might not be great. They might have a very limited airfill. So by really roughening that posterior stroma, you don't rely so much on a good airfill at the end of the case. We next prepared a DSEC lent lenticule for insertion. So this was a very nice, uh, graft here that you can see is very clear. And we can see that the graft is um, doesn't have the S configuration. So this is the endothelium looking towards you, endothelium looking towards the surgeon. And we're preparing this lenticule. These are 23 gauge DSEC forceps, um, which we use from Katina. Um, and we use these to insert the graft using a pull through technique. So here I'm separating the DSEC lenticule. I believe this was a sub 80 micron uh, graft, separating it from the uh, rest of the cornea. We load the DSEC graft on the boost and glide. And once the graft is well centered in the boost and glide, we then use that same DSEC forcep to pull it through the boost and glide and just expose uh, a, a partial tip of that DSEC lenticule. Once our DSEC graft is loaded on the boosting glide, we turn it upside down, endothelium facing down, and we um, get it really close to that main corneal wound. So this is about a four millimeter wound, and we use that DSEC 
forcep to grasp the desec lenticule and pull it through. So you can see the desec lenticule here that's being pulled through. And I forgot to mention, we have an AC maintainer that helps, support, that helps maintain the anterior chamber. And I leave the anterior chamber on the, the I leave the uh, AC maintainer on when I'm inserting the, the graft to prevent collapse of that anterior chamber. So the AC maintainer helps maintain stability of the uh, chamber when you're introducing the graft. Now we have the DSEC graft that is in the right orientation. It's already in the AC. So that's what we want to see. That's the benefit of the pull through, pull through technique with the boost and glide is that you have very predictable results when you introduce the graft into the anterior chamber. Um, that's one of the main benefits that I've seen. We then remove that AC maintainer once the graft is already inserted. <clears throat> I always suture the main wound with one or two sutures. And I also suture that wound where we had the AC maintainer. Very important to suture those wounds, the main wound and the AC maintainer wound, so that you can have a good air fill without leakage of your air. That's very important. The one thing you don't want to do is not suture your wounds and then try to get a good air fill and then that air just keeps on leaving your wounds because you're not sutured. Um, it's better to do this before uh, than after you start manipulating your graft. So we sutured the main wound and the AC maintainer wound to get a good pressure air fill. We then use the LASIK roller once the graft is centered and we've introduced the air. We now um, use a LASIK roller to just massage the graft in all directions to reduce or eliminate some of that uh, fluid that would be in the interface. So you can just see here in this picture that we have a great air fill and we see the S on our graft which confirms that we have the right orientation endothelium face down. Once the descent graft is centered and we've had our, our air fill for about 10 minutes and we've removed that interface fluid with that LASIK roller, we then proceed to remove uh, most of that air and leave about a 50% air bubble, which you can see here, maybe a little bit less than 50%. But anyway, this patient did very well. She ended, she ended up with a very clear cornea postoperatively and she was very, very happy. So I'm very happy for her outcome and glad she did well. She was very less symptomatic. Her vision improved to around 2060, um, which is a lot better than what she was before. So there have been other studies looking at the outcomes of DSEC graft with uh, uh, glaucoma drainage devices, specifically Ahmed valves. Um, this is a study from England in which they had 14 eyes from 13 patients and they looked at, at, the, at the survival rates of DSEC with glaucoma drainage devices. After six months, DSEC grafts remain clear in 85% of patients. After one year, about 70% of grafts were clear. After 18 months, 50% 50, 50 of grafts were clear. So you can start seeing as well that decline in graft survival. And after 30 months, only 30% of grafts were clear. The survival rate of a second DSEC graft was 100% after six months. After one year, most of those graphs were clear. And after 18 months, 75% of those graphs were clear. And after two years, about 70% of those, gra those graphs remained clear. So the conclusion of this study and for us is that DSEC is a very viable alternative to PKP to restore visual function in eyes with almond valves. And this, uh, this study also found that the, the patients that had better controlled intraocular pressure had longer uh, lasting grafts. So IOP was an important risk factor for graft failure. So when you compare DSEC and PKP uh, for uh, the treatment of endothelial cell disease in the glaucoma patient, you will see that DSEC carries a lower risk of endothelial cell rejection compared to PKP. Another advantage of DSEC is that these patients don't need to be on topical steroids for such a long time. Remember, when you have a patient with a PKP, you'll have them on Predforte or Durazole, um, and you taper it very slowly. Usually after every three, two to three months is when you start tapering the steroid. And during that time that you had them on the steroid, what's going to happen is that the risk of a steroid response 
is also going to be there. So you're going to have, you're more likely to have a steroid response. And from my experience, patients that have glaucoma always, almost always end up having more of a steroid response. So one of the beauties and advantages of, advantages of DSEC is that you can wean off that steroid faster. And you can maybe transition to a loaded prednol steroid instead of Predforte or Durazol and have less risk of a steroid response. And you also provide faster visual rehabilitation and it's a less invasive surgery. And if you ever need to replace a DSEC graft, if it happens to fail uh, in these patients, keep in mind that you can always replace a DSEC graft. I mean, the technique is pretty feasible, pretty straightforward. Uh, as far as removing that DSEC graft, you usually use a bent uh, uh, 27 gauge needle, about half inch needle, 27 gauge, bend the needle tip, and then use that needle tip to just um, release or sever the adhesions between the patient's endothelium and the DSEC graft in the periphery. You do that 360 degrees, and then you just gently pull the DSEC graft away from the edges and then the center, remove it, and then you know do your surgery again. Well, in conclusion, some of the unique challenges of DSEC and eyes with tube shunts is that tube damage to the donor endothelium during insertion can also result in failure. So we have to keep in mind that if these patients have an AMID valve and the tube is very long, um, we might have to just snip or, or, or uh, cut the, the tube, um, decrease its length so that there's less risk of direct trauma when we're doing an insertion. It is harder to reach a superphysiologic IOP in the presence of an AMID valve or a TRAB. So that's why it's very important to roughen that, that stroma uh, before we insert the graft. And just like a PKP procedure, we have to keep in mind that IOP is very important uh, for secondary graft failure. So we always have to keep in mind how are we gonna control IOP in this patient? And one of the ways we can do that is by weaning them a little bit earlier off those steroids. So what does the future hold? Well, perhaps in the future, and there's studies ongoing, well, we might not have to do uh, cornea transplants to treat endothelial cell dysfunction. In the future, we might be inject in injecting um, endothelial cells into the anterior chamber using rho kinase inhibitors, and this might uh, make uh, trans uh, corneas clear. You know, it might uh, there might be replenishing of endothelial cells um, just by injecting them into the anterior chamber and using right row kinase inhibitors, which have been shown to uh, promote migration of endothelial cells. Um, these studies have been ongoing in many parts of the world, but primarily in Japan, uh, as you can see here in the study in 2010 by Okumura. So in conclusion, Glaucoma, implant, proximity, stability, and the altered proteome can all affect endothelial cell density. DSEC is a very viable alternative to PKP in patients with endothelial dysfunction and glaucoma filtering surgeries or drainage devices. And always remember to uh, have that chair time with your patients. Sit down with your patients, explain to them that um, there is a decreased life expectancy of the cornea transplant um, in the presence of a uh, of a implant or a trap or a glaucoma drainage device. These corneas, uh, as we know, um, will not last as long in the presence of these previous glaucoma surgeries. I would like to thank you all for your attention. I would like to thank, thank uh, Eversight for this opportunity. Thanks to Michael for uh, helping host the event. And my email is shown here below. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Massenegro. Um, <clears throat> everybody has an opportunity now. Um, if you have any questions uh, right now for Dr. Massenegro, you can enter um, them into the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. And um, I'll just ask a question or two while we wait to see if anybody's going to um, enter anything. Um, you mentioned uh, a study um, looking at a protein, proteonomic analysis of um, aqueous humor uh, with the AMED valve um, and that that device has is supposed to prevent retrograde flow um, into the anterior chamber. Um, are you aware if the, if the AMED is, 
if, if any similar studies have been done with the Barvelt valve, the other popular GDD, um, similar studies and whether the Ahmed has an advantage um, with those valves um, compared to the bar valve? Well, you know, the Ahmed valve in and of itself has a valve, the technology is valve. So the, the flow is supposed to be from the anterior chamber through the tube to that subconjunctival space. But there still is some retrograde flow, which is what that study showed, because those proteins are normally not found in the anterior chamber. So those proteins normally are either expressed at very low levels or not present. So there is retrograde flow. So with the bar, with the bar belt, one of the differences is that you can have um, earlier hypotony. It tends to lower IOP a little bit lower than the Ahmed valve. So, um, so there's differences in their design. But to my knowledge, there have not been any studies um, looking at the survival rate of the DSEC or PKP graphs and looking at the proteome with the um, bar belts. I think this study just tried to, tried to keep it more homogenous. So they stuck mainly with Ahmed valves just to keep the study more homogenous. Sure. You know, makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have one question um, from the audience that I'll, I'll read here for you. Um, Great. If a patient with a tube, a bar belt tube, um, in the anterior chamber has a dysaic and a fairly early graft failure, less than one year, um, but it does not appear to be an immunologic rejection, would you suggest uh, pushing glaucoma to move the tube um, from the limbus posteriorly? So, great question. I mean, if the, if the tube is well positioned, so in this scenario, is the tube touching the endothelium or it's not? Um, you, can, you can answer in the chat, Dr. Newman. She says not. Okay. So, great question. If the tube is not touching the corneal endothelium and the graft is still fairly clear, then I would probably not uh, push the glaucoma further posterior at that point. Um, if I can, I would perhaps try increasing steroids a little bit more in this patient, depending on what the IOP is. Maybe increasing the steroids a little bit more would help those endothelial cells in the presence of this bar belt implant. So and also she... consider the medications in the ocular surface. That's very important. Um, keep in mind, the ocular surface, the epithelium, that ocular surface environment also plays a role in graft survival. Yeah. That's why our PK graphs, when we have a poor ocular surface, don't do well. I believe we can translate those results also to DSEC and DMAC graphs as well. You need to have a good ocular surface. So look at the whole picture. Um, if you can you know, optimize the ocular surface, and maybe transition that patient to other eye drops like uh, rho kinase inhibitors that might have might have a positive impact on the endothelial cells. You could consider that adding a medication like Repressa or, or Roclitan to uh, manage uh, control the IOP and also remove eye drops that can negatively affect the corneal endothelium, like your carbonic anhydrous inhibitors. If you have a patient under zolamide and they have a DSEC graft and the graft is starting to fail. If they're under zolomide, I would probably remove the zolomide from the picture and substitute it with another eye drop. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Newman, who submitted the question, says she trimmed the tube during the first uh, transplant in hopes that that didn't um, uh, won't prevent it from getting moved if necessary in the future, which I guess is also a consideration. Yeah, I mean, trimming, um, if you trim the tube for the first DSEC, I think that's great because it's actually going to help you have an easier insertion. Um, so for those of you that feel comfortable trimming the tube and you, and you believe it's going to help you with the surgery and it won't really affect the efficacy of the implant, then it's definitely something to consider. And do you think that that would potentially um, limit the ability to move um, the tube from the limbus to the pars plana. Um, so that would be a different procedure. So once the tube is already in the anterior chamber, 
um, it'll usually stay in the interior chamber. Whether you can move a tube from the anterior chamber to the pars plana, um, that's something that I have not had experience doing, mm -hmm. but that's a great question. I mean, I'm wondering if you can still keep that same tube, not replace it, and um, you know, just reposition it in the pars plana. Um, I think that that could be done. You know, I think yeah. it could definitely be done. It's the same, the same device. Probably like have to get the showed, glaucoma colleagues involved. I would call it glaucoma colleague, but like that study showed, that study that compared the uh, glaucoma drainage device uh, life, uh, the cornea transplant lifespan, with the pars plana glaucoma drainage device, it showed that the rates of graft survival were similar uh, when you compare it to the to the anterior chamber uh, uh, implant. So mm -hmm. even though the GDD is in the pars plana, you know, you can still have graft failure, even though that tube is miles away from the corneal endothelium. I thought that was a very, very impressive, you know, a very yeah. uh, interesting finding. Um, we have one more um, question from the audience. Um, what, what is your feeling about the optimal order for a patient with a failing cornea and glaucoma, disaic and then tube, or tube and then disaic, assuming that pressure is controlled on maximal medical drops? Okay, so to answer this question, to answer this question, um, Alex, Alex, uh, hi there. Uh, good, to, glad, glad that you're here. Um, so my approach in this setting would be to first do the first do the tube, and the reason for that is that you want to control IOP first. That's the reason. So in a patient that has glaucoma and their cornea is decompensated, um, and they need a surgery, a glaucoma a filter, um, or a tube. I want to control IOP because I know that IOP is going to be very important for graft survival. So I would do the tube surgery first, control IOP, and then proceed to do a DSEC graft or a DMEC. But, you know, um, DMEC, I think in D's eyes, you know, you have to be very comfortable with DMEC to pull off a DMEC when you have a tube or a trap. Although, you know, as we all know, there's some surgeons that are doing DMEC in D's eyes as well. Yeah. In in it, I, I have one more um quick question. Um the um oh Alex says thank you, Dan. Great talk. Um so <clears throat> do you so you showed the abuse and glide technique um with a fairly thin graft. Um I know you've used very thin graphs in the past, um, like you know, sub 50 range. Um, is, is the Buse and Glide your standard technique and in, 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 are there other techniques you might suggest, um, that give an advantage in these complicated eyes, let's say compared to the most traditional forceps fold, uh, technique. So when I started doing DSEC surgery, um, I learned it using the taco fold technique, uh, with the Rosenwasser forcep. We would do our traditional 60-40 taco and insert that into the uh, into the anterior chamber. Um, the beauty of the boost and glide technique with the forcep is that you know I did over 50 consecutive cases you know during one time using this technique, and the it's so predictable. It's so predictable if you keep your technique if you're consistent with your technique using your anterior, your anterior chamber maintainer, um, loading that DSEC graft the right way, controlling the fluidics of the anterior chamber while you're inserting that lenticule, um, putting your sutures on your main wound, putting your suture, your, your tenon nylon suture on, the, on that AC maintainer wound after you remove it. You know, first of all, you're gonna have a, a pretty good air fill for most cases. Um, you know that your graft is going to be in the right orientation mm -hmm. as soon as you insert it. And the AC maintainer um, helps you open the graft. So when the graft is inserted, uh, when you turn on that AC maintainer, then the graft will just open. 
And then all you have to do is just give it a few taps or maybe one pull to center it. And you can do your air fill, air fill and be done with it. So the outcomes are very predictable. So I think that a pull through technique is better than a pushing technique. And the other variations of a pull through technique are, um, you know, you can use an endoserter to pull pull the tissue as you know, most of you have had experience with an endoserter. Um, but in my hands, the boost and glide and the uh, DSEC force up work very well. And the instruments are reusable. That's what that's another advantage. So it's 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 you know, and I like things that are good for the environment. So these are instruments that I can reuse in the OR. But if you feel comfortable with an endoserter, it's it's still a pull through technique, and it, and I know that it can also give a very good results. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Newman um, says thanks for the the shout out for the Rosenwasser forceps her her dad, Dr. Uh, Rosenwasser. Um, and she says she also um, uses an endoserter only on select cases um, these days. Um, and if anyone, uh, oh, we have one more uh, question. Um, uh, have you had any cases where the um, AC air immediately and repeatedly goes into the trab or up the tube? And how have you handled that? Well, hi, Chris. Um, so in most of these cases, um, we're able to get, you know, maybe not a super physiologic IOP with a really good air fail. Um, um, I've never had a case where I just, with a glaucoma, with a trab or a tube, I've never had a case where I can't get uh, at least like a 60% air fill. So that personally has not happened to me, but I can see how that can happen um, with a similar case, an analogy happening in a patient that's aphakic in a unicameral eye. A unicameral eye or an itis had a vitrectomy, um, you can, it can be very challenging to have a good air fill. Um, something to consider is tying the tube with a suture um, just temporarily to try to get that air fill. But that tying the tube is something that you probably want to do before you even insert that graft. So it's hard to know until you start the case. Or you can attempt to tie the tube after you've inserted the graft. But then as you're manipulating to tie, tying a tube with the graft already being inserted, there's more risk of causing, uh, of damaging the graft by that manipulation. But I've, I, I have had patients that are, for example, um, status post vitrectomy, especially unicameral eyes, they're still pseudophagic. They might have a PCIOL, but they've had a vitrectomy. And in these patients, it can be very hard to get a good air fill. But again, roughening that posterior stroma in the periphery and mid periphery, being aggressive with that roughening helps you get better adherence of that graft, that patient's cornea, and not relying so much on that air fill. And even on post-op day one, if they have no air because it's all migrated through the tube or to the vitreous, um, your graft might still be attached. And now um, just another very important point. One of the advantages of DSEC in these patients is that even if postoperatively, their DSEC grafts are not 100% attached. If let's say they have a 70% or 80% graft detachment, but your surgery went great, but postoperatively that graft is detached and they only have about 20% attachment, don't be pushed to rebubbling immediately. That's my advice. I've seen patients that have large detachments after a DSEC, and then with time, they'll zipper up and attach on their own. So the recovery time may be longer, but you don't always have to rebubble that graft because with DSEC, um, it just can actually reattach on its own. So you can have a uh, mostly detached graft that can reattach spontaneously um, if it's centered, if it's centered. Now, if it's decentered, that's a different story. You might have to reposition, but if it's centered and partially detached, you can just observe. You don't have to rebubble like you have to do in a DMAC. So that's one of the nice things about 
these second D scenarios. Hmm. Yeah. Well, how closely would you watch a patient that had a detachment like that? Would you see them every day? Um, to um, look not every, not every day, Michael. I had a patient that that um, I did a cataract surgery that was complicated with the PC tear, and I was planning on doing a combined uh, DSEC and cataract surgery. So because of the uh, posterior capsule tear complication during the FACO, I postponed a DSEC in this patient, and he had mm -hmm. fuchs dystrophy. The patient had fuchs dystrophy. So I just did the cataract surgery alone. I put an IOL on the sulcus. Then I waited about two months after the cataract surgery, made sure, made sure he didn't have any cystoid macular edema or other complications. And I did the DSEC afterwards when, uh, as a staged procedure. And this was a patient that um, the DSEC went great and he had uh, about a 70% detachment. And I did uh, some research about pe other people's experience in these scenarios, uh, much more experienced surgeons. And one of them had mentioned, just observe, continue your steroids, you know, make sure the IOP is controlled. If your graft is attached, you don't have to rebubble it immediately because they might not get a good airfill. These are patients that have unicameral eyes. They've had a vitrectomy already. So you might not get a really good airfill so why put them through that increased risk of trying to get more air in the anterior chamber and, um, you know, increasing more complications? You can just sit, observe. And after about um, two months, he was fully attached. Hmm. But he gradually improved with time. So give the graphs a chance if they're detached. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. And so... Um, I don't see any, any more, um, questions. Um, uh, oh, wait, I do see another question. Um, do you have any advice for thinking about to say graphs that adhere, but never clear the cornea? So one scenario to consider about a DSEC graft that looks adhered, but doesn't clear the cornea is that the graft could be upside down, that could be a possibility, um, an upside down graft. Um, another possibility is um, this pr primary graft failure. You know, usually I give these grafts about, you know, a month. I wanna make sure that the clear, I can see clearing after about, usually you'll, you'll begin to see clearing after about four days. But um, I would let, I would give about, three weeks and expect the graft to really show signs of clearing. If after about three weeks is, you know, is not showing signs of clearing, I'm suspecting already primary graft failure or some other, some other scenario like an upside down graft. And you can always manage them conservatively with, uh, with your steroids um, to reduce inflammation and help those endothelial cells, maybe increasing the steroids, but if you increase steroids and the IOP is controlled, um, and it is not clearing that I, then I would consider primary graft failure or a malpositioned graft. Great. Or other scenarios like uh, epithelial downgrowth into the anterior chamber, you know, which is sometimes difficult to diagnose. If you have downgrowth of epithelial cells, those epithelial cells can, you know, replace the endothelial cells and also cause uh, graft failure. So keep a uh, um, epithelial downgrowth in, the in, the, in that differential. Great. It looks like that is it for the questions. Um, and so um, thank you so much, Dr. Montenegro. That was great. I think, um, you know, managing um, corneal decompensation in these complicated patients is a really uh, great topic. Um, and I think that um, uh, clearly from the, the discussion and the questions, this is a, a very common um, scenario that people are running into in practice. So um, really important talk. And, and I thank you. And uh, that's it for tonight, everyone. Thank Any you very much, everyone. Work? It was a very wonderful event. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. It was great to catch up with all of you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much. We'll see Take everybody care. next month. Have a good all night. Right. Everyone. Bye bye, everyone. Good night. Bye.